This podcast was recorded on 27 March, 10 a.m. Jakarta time. Things may have changed by the time you hear this. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Reformacy Dispatch. I'm Jeff Hutton. And I'm Kevin O'Rourke. Kevin, good to hear you. We've got a slight change today because we just had a fantastic interview with uh, Ben Bland. And I think uh, you and I agreed that it was it was so good, we wanted to get it out rather fast. Yeah, I don't know why they call him Bland. He really wasn't all that bland. He's not bland. He's punchy. <laughs> I'm sure that's, that's not a joke he uh, has never heard before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the show today, we're going to talk before we get to the interview about uh, Megawati and uh, her seemingly kind words, opportune words for uh, Trin Rismaharini, the former mayor of Surabaya and the current cabinet minister for Fair social services, right? That's what, what she basically oversees. And then we're going to talk about the Bandung Spast-ish train uh, that isn't coming along so quickly. It's, uh, it's delayed. First, I think we need to talk about vaccines and where we're going with that. What's, what's the latest on vaccines here? 630,000 uh, administered on one day this week. That was a record. So the pace is accelerating. Plus uh, a new shipment came in from China. So the stockpile is actually adequate for this pace for the next uh, month, uh, at least uh, maybe uh, two months even. There's a little bit of concern because in addition to uh, Coronavac from China, to a lesser extent, Indonesia was relying on uh, the COVAX facility to provide the AstraZeneca vaccine. And India, of course, has uh, announced a suspension of its exports of the AstraZeneca that it produces from the Serum Institute in order to focus on the, the domestic population in India. So that's a little bit of a hiccup. But um, overall, you know, the, the I think what, what's been proven is that uh, the system in Indonesia can accommodate mass vaccinations. The, the personnel are there, the know-how is there, the, the organizational infrastructure. Um, you know, there is a public health function in Indonesia and there's a lot of uh, administrative capability. So, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for vaccinations too. That is not necessarily a given in a country that can be fairly religious, where religiosity can wreak havoc with the best planning so you're you're saying that a majority Muslim country like Indonesia that can get kind of touchy about vaccines because they might contain poor products, they are accepting this one. Yeah, that's right. Um, there's good uh, poll data on this. Uh, during the first week of March, uh, Saiful Mujani Research and Consulting, uh, arguably the uh, premier polling firm, conducted uh, a survey nationwide with face-to-face -face interviews, which is significant. So it was not a telephone poll, which tends to skew results. And uh, they found that 69% of respondents are either planning to receive a vaccine if available, or they're at least thinking about it. So specifically, it's 46% said they're planning on taking it, and then another 23% said that they're considering it. So that's not bad. And I think that, yeah, those people who are considering it, or probably most of them will uh, accept it once people around them are accepting it, and once there's a safety record established and so on. So... Um, the ones that are rejecting it are, are smaller in number. And there, there's other poll data done earlier last year that showed that the major concern among those who are skeptical is not actually religious tenets, but rather concern about who would foot the bill in the case of side effects. And so that's a pretty valid practical concern. And, and that's why it can be addressed. I mean, because, you, you, you know, the side effects are not going to be major. So, um, you know, the health insurance scheme maybe, for example, could cover that and that could be a factor that assuages a lot of those people. So, um, yeah, for now, it doesn't seem as if uh, uh, vaccine acceptability is a problem in Indonesia. I think we need to remind people, too, that this is a country that has had a pretty good track record when it's come to public health um, efforts. And I, I'm thinking about, of course, smallpox. That, that was eradicated. Uh, there's been some flare-ups around 
uh, the border with, with Papua New Guinea. I'm thinking about HIV and the, the rollout of medication for those infected. It's free since 2005, 2006. I'm thinking about tuberculosis programs where the Puskesmas people actually go into uh, communities at the times when the mothers are home and talk to them about, you know, who's healthy, who's not. There's a, and of course, it's the BPJS which has vastly expanded access to basic care for most people. So I think that there's every expectation that Indonesia can roll this out fast at an impressive rate for a country of its means. Yeah, it's really more a matter of the um, distribution logistics in the remote rural areas, um, which is going to be a big problem in those types of areas. But those are not the areas that account for the bulk of the population nor the bulk of the economy. And then the other concern is simply the uh, supply from China. Yeah, right. It's but then there, there's a fairly big state-owned enterprise that is producing it locally. So I think they've they've got a lot of a lot of things going right. Yeah. So yeah, Indonesia has this uh, terrific asset, which is a state-owned enterprise called the uh, PT Biopharma. It uh, dates back about a century. It reflects the fact that Indonesia is a big country, so it, it merits having its own vaccine producing company. Uh, and that has a capacity of 100 million doses uh, per annum, but they're going to double that this year. And then there's three other companies that are uh, getting involved in vaccine production as well. However, for now, they rely on the raw materials and ingredients for Coronavac to come from China. And China is supplying those at the rate of about, uh, it's been about 15 million a month, and that's expected to increase to about 20 to 30 million a month. And there's an agreement for Indonesia to receive a total of 140 million uh, in total from China by the end of June. And they're on track to reach that. Then uh, next year, there's expectations that Indonesia will have its own homemade vaccine called the uh, vaccine Meraputi. So, you know, if, if so, that would be helpful. Right. Has there been much of a socialization program launched yet? Are, are, is the government out there actively advertising? Uh, you know, say it's it's part of your duty as an Indonesian to get out there and get vaccinated because that that would be. Yeah, yeah, that that is happening. I mean, the the, the focus has been on the health protocol so far, uh, and that's still uh, occupying a lot of the bandwidth, so to speak. But um, yeah, there's definitely vaccine messaging. You know, a lot of the the leaders and public officials. Have uh, set examples by uh, taking the vaccine themselves. Uh, um, the other big thing happening, though, that's uh, going to be a, a bit of a distraction is a plan by the government to cancel the mudik, which is the uh, annual exodus out of the cities. Ah, uh, yes, it's that time of year again. <laughs> right. And it's, uh, it's not the easiest thing to cancel. It's not like clicking a light switch. No, that's right. Yeah, the concern is the mass uh, traveling is going to create another spike in cases. So that was uh, exactly what happened uh, at Eidl Fitri last year and uh, also following the long holiday around Christmas and New Year's in December. So, so the government is uh, being uh, cautious and um, to, to ban or prohibit this uh, exodus is uh, really a dramatic move because um, literally... Uh, you know, the bulk of the urban population of the country picks up and leaves uh, for a few days up to a week. And then the roads and the trains and the airports are just completely packed during that time. Yeah. Uh, How do you think that's going to go? I mean, because last year when uh, officials were dealing with Mudik Liberan, COVID was new. Uh, it hadn't really manifested. It may have just been sort of um, something that was, that was academic or theoretical. But after a year, could go... Are people exhausted with it and don't care, or they know what to do? They wear a mask, they wash their hands, or they take it seriously, or the, maybe the the government is more prepared to uh, restrict uh, a reg or better regulate um, travel home. How, how do you think that might go? What, what's the mood? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think you've touched on the the points there because uh, the everybody's been through the really uh, genuinely frightening experience of January when the hospitals were completely full and there was just a lot of distress. So uh, no longer really, I don't think, are many people uh, taking this lightly. So that's uh, certainly true for public officials. Uh, and I think it's also true for the bulk of the public. So So that is a big difference from last year. Nonetheless, the fact remains that this uh, mudik is just such a gigantic phenomenon that uh, it's, it's just not going to be possible to, uh, to you know, stop it entirely. The, the government can literally shut down the airports and shut down the train stations and um, prohibit buses from operating. But 
there's going to be vehicles and motorcycles on every back street on Java. <laughs> and there's just, there's, there's going to be no way to stop that. So, so there, there, there are probably, despite all the best efforts, there's probably going to be another spike in cases um, after Edel Fitri in May. I guess also, though, a lot of people, a lot of those office workers, a lot of those people who are working in restaurants, they're still home. They haven't come back to Jakarta. Maybe there's just fewer people to, to Mudik. All right, let's, let, let's move on. At a book launch, uh, Megawati Sikandaputri, former president and the chair of the PDIP, uh, made a point of saying very kind words, very uh, very glowing terms of her friend, Tri Risma Harini. And at one point said that um, Ibu Tri was working herself to the bone and she's, uh, she, she's lost weight as a result, uh, the extent to which she's taking her job so seriously. You think that she might be putting her thumb on the scale potentially to the detriment of other luminaries like uh, Ganja Pranowo. Right, because uh, conspicuously absent from Megawati's remarks, which happen fairly rarely, Megawati doesn't really uh, deliver speeches like this all that often, uh, but conspicuously absent from it was any mention whatsoever of Ganjar Pranowo, even though polls clearly show that uh, he is um, distinctly in second place in presidential uh, preference rankings. And, uh, you know, the next presidential election is not that far away. It's in mid-2024, but parties are going to need to be uh, submitting their nominations probably in mid-2023, uh, which means they're, they're really going to be kicking into high gear in terms of uh, maneuvering and negotiating and positioning themselves uh, by mid-2022, which is just over a year away. So uh, it's clear that the presidential election is driving the positions and stances and maneuvers of politicians right now. Uh, and then here we have this uh, fairly rare speech by Megawati, which was uh, an address at a book launch. And she uh, really dwelled on uh, Tri Risma Maharini for quite a while, uh, with no mention whatsoever of Ganjar. And this comes in, in, in against the backdrop of a lot of awkwardness that occurred in 2012, when Megawati was extremely hesitant to nominate Joko Widodo for governor of Jakarta. And again, in 2014, when she also waited till the very last minute before acquiescing to his nomination for president that year. And in both cases, it was very costly because Widodo lost opportunities to um, advertise himself more widely. Uh, and in both times, he just barely kind of squeaked through in those elections. How should we be thinking about Sri Risma Harini and Governor Ganjar as candidates? How are they equally matched? Well, uh, they both have uh, they both share one really key asset, which is uh, neither of them is Prabowo Subianto. So the important thing. That's a glib answer. <laughs> Good, but true. Yes, that's true. But also, also with the track record, right, of a really good track record, both of them. I mean, the, the country would be well served by either one. So this is an embarrassment of riches that the PDIP has in some respects. Yeah, that's right. They've got two bona fide, legitimate, yeah, potential contenders there, um, and most parties have none. So the the, the point is that uh, Prabowo Subianto is uh, in first place, and in, in the in the one credible face-to-face -face poll available from December from SMRC. And uh, it's a concern because, you know, as you mentioned, he's got no record in executive office until becoming defense minister a year and a half ago. And um, he did that with a, got into the cabinet with a party colleague. And immediately that party colleague, um, Eddie Prabowo, uh, perpetrated a, a pretty vast corruption scandal, um, investigators. Yeah, 90 billion rupiah in losses to the state due to... Uh, yeah, this uh, fishery scandal involving the export of lobster spawn and, uh, and a cartel and kickbacks and so on. Um, and Prabowo you know, just has a temperament, which is a, a concern for uh, Indonesia's outlook. Um, he's, he's got very nationalist, strident messages and um, not, not very pragmatic uh, stances on economic policymaking. So uh, meanwhile, uh, Ganjar has uh, performed pretty well as uh, governor of the third largest province over the past eight years. And he's uh, quite close behind Prabowo in the polls, uh, very much within reach. Uh, and yet Megawati is instead uh, dwelling on uh, Tri Risma, who is, is quite a bit further behind because she's only been the mayor of a city, not, not the governor of a province. And um, she's just not as well known nationwide as Ganjar is. So, yeah, it's a little odd. So you think that Megawati acting in this way um, carries the risk of sort of hiding, well, sort of tamping down good candidates while boosting the chances of uh, of Prabowo Subianto. 
Yeah, inadvertently, this is uh, beneficial to Prabowo because right now it's critical for Ganjar to reach a broader audience. So he's uh, wildly popular within central Java, which is important because there's a lot of people there. But uh, he's not well known at all outside. And he needs people like Megawati to be elevating his profile um, um, among the national electorate. And uh, that's what this time right now is, is so precious for. But uh, it's not happening. She doesn't seem to be showing uh, him much attention whatsoever. Might she be muddy in the waters so that uh, Puan can get uh, the, the nod? Yeah, good point. So uh, it's obvious that uh, she very much wants the Sukarno clan to perpetuate its political lineage. So her, her father founded the country and founded uh, the party that she now heads, basically. And uh, she had been president. And then her daughter has been elevated uh, step by step through the ranks and is now Speaker of Parliament with, however, 1% support in presidential preference polls. So yeah, Puan Maharani just uh, is not viable as a presidential contender. But as a uh, vice presidential running mate to somebody else, that's conceivable. And so, therefore, there's lots of uh, suspicion that Megawati could uh, uh, thwart or uh, ignore Ganjar, not nominate a presidential contender uh, from PDIP, but instead uh, join forces with uh, another party, which would be a smaller party, and uh, provide Juan as the running mate on that ticket. And that could be Garindra with Prabowo, uh, or it could be some other configuration. But that would be hugely unpopular with PDIP figures. PDIP is the biggest party, so it should be incumbent upon them to put forth their own nominee for president. How much sway does Ibu Mega retain in a party? Was she in the party when um, she was pretty hesitant with uh, Joko Widodo and he got through anyway? And she's tried several occasions to get reelected. Uh, well, uh, let me see, three times to get reelected as um, president. Just how much, uh, how much sway does she have? Right. Yeah. So something happened there in, in 2012, uh, gubernatorial race in Jakarta and also in 2014. And we don't know who uh, prevailed upon her or whether it was uh, she herself who finally came to a decision. I mean, uh, it worked. Um, they won in 2012 in Jakarta and in the presidential elections in 2014 and 2019. So it's kind of hard to falter. She actually does have a good track record. So maybe uh, there's method of madness. <laughs> okay, moving on to fast-ish trains that are not moving along so fast. The uh, Jakarta Bandung high-speed rail that's being led, rather, by a Chinese consortium is late and over budget. But over budget by you know a, a not insignificant amount is not a huge amount. When I read this, I immediately thought about the New York Times story about BRI scheme in Sri Lanka, where an entire port was basically handed over to the Chinese, and uh, that this was and that was like a cautionary tale of uh, there are strings attached to the money. There might be some parallels here, where um, there might be a need of a bailout, and that would increase the stake of the Chinese consortium uh, to at least parity, potentially to parity. Um, what you're thinking about the train link in the first place, the necessity of it, and um, why is it so late? This uh, this is the uh, the most high profile Chinese project in Indonesia by far, even though it's actually not the biggest in terms of investment value, but. It's nonetheless very large, um, $6 billion. And it's for a train that would link two cities over a, a distance as the crow flies of uh, 70 miles. So it comes out to about $86 million per mile on that measure. Of course, it, it's not a direct line. It's a bit roundabout. So it ends up actually being a little bit cheaper than that. And, and that's on par with the development of fast trains elsewhere in the world. But nonetheless, it's just a, a huge cost for Indonesia to uh, shoulder uh, just for linking Jakarta with Bandung, when in, in fact, you know, just a medium fast train would already be a huge improvement. So the, the project, the, pre the premise for the project itself was always very weak. And, and there were also offers from Japanese investors for you know, other solutions and uh, other rail projects that would have been more sensible with less onerous financing also. 
So it's uh, a, a combination of missteps, really, because um, you know, it was a, a risky and arguably unnecessary project to begin with. And then uh, it uh, apparently suffered from poor cost estimates. And so now there's cost overruns. And the way it's structured is difficult to provide the, the necessary financing. At issue is that the Indonesian partners are a consortium of state-owned enterprises that did not really supply very much cash at all. Their equity is really in the form of land uh, and other assets and um, construction capacity, whereas the uh, the financing is really from the um, the Chinese uh, shareholder Beijing Yawan and then um, uh, a loan from the uh, China Development Bank. So what it means is that when they need more money, uh, the uh, Indonesian partners don't have it. They're cash strapped, always have been. And so it's, it falls upon the Chinese to uh, add more. I should add that this all comes from a, a sole source. So it's just not really clear exactly what's happening with the project. But Tempo, the best investigative uh, media outlet in Indonesia, cited sources saying that the project has a 23% cost overrun. Um, so there's an extra um, uh, about $1.5 billion that's uh, required. And uh, it's already... Uh, two years behind schedule for completion, and they still have a way to go. And there's big problems with uh, more than 400 locations where there's a need to move water mains or power lines or uh, even streams and canals and things like that. Wow. It's such an impressive sight. When you drive into Bandung, you see these pylons or high-speed rail line and the great big impressive cranes and all the machinery and not um, and you see it stretch into the horizon and it goes, spans valleys and winds its way through the tea plantations. It's really something that I confess to whenever I'm going, driving to Bandung, I see that and I think, well, things are moving along. There's a chance of getting to Bandung rather quickly. And then, you know, I think I saw stories about Bandung potentially becoming a commuter town and all that sort of stuff. But it really sort of speaks to the <laughs> some planning not being detailed enough. And I heard, you know, I spoke once with the ambassador, the Japanese ambassador, who, of course, was pushing his, his own barrel. And he thought the decision might have been something that got mixed up with um, plans to revitalize the northern line, the, one, the, the, the Surabaya line, and that maybe the powers that be were trying to throw the Chinese uh, project and then they'll throw the Japanese a project. And, and it, you know, switching systems and rolling stock don't work that way. It all has to be on the same sort of technology, right? There might have been politics play more than practicality. That's right. Yeah. Economically, I think it uh, matters more to create a better link between Jakarta all the way across the north coast of Java to Surabaya. And that's what the Japanese were offering with a uh, medium fast train. Um, but uh, instead, Widodo opted to uh, pursue the uh, fast train to Bandung instead first. You think that there's a chance that it might be mothballed, that they might just shelve the whole thing? I guess that, that would be cataclysmic. Right. Well, um, if um, the uh, Chinese partners are willing to uh, supply the additional capital required and yet still remain a minority partner, that would be one solution. But given the sums involved, I'm not sure the arithmetic works out. Uh, meanwhile, because the Indonesian cons consortium partners lack cash, uh, the only source, I think, would be probably from the state budget. Uh, yet another equity injection into state enterprises from the government. And the timing for that could not be worse. They're just brimming with cash. <laughs> yeah, tax revenues are down. The economy is in recession. There's uh, spending on social services and pandemic recovery. Plus, the government is already covering a total of uh, $40 trillion in losses, uh, yeah, well over $2 billion uh, from the ASABRI and the Jiwasraya uh, scandals, state uh, pension fund and uh, insurance company. So, it's seemingly unlikely that the government could uh, fill this whole this fiscal year anyway. So more delays might, might happen, yeah. More delays, more time on the tollway to Banjo. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Coming up, our interview with Ben Bland of the Lowy Institute.
Ben Bland, welcome back. Great to be with you both. Your book, Man of Contradictions, Joko Widodo and the Struggle to Remake Indonesia is uh, coming to Indonesia, right? Uh, Penguin is going is, uh, to gonna be publishing outside of Australia. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks so much. It's it's been a while coming, but really pleased to see that the Penguin Southeast Asia has has picked up the rights and will hopefully be distributing it all around the region and should give it a nice second wind and also yeah help readers in Indonesia and the rest of the region get hold of it. And that's that's really interesting for me to see see how how they react. Obviously, I'm an outsider, and I guess the primary audience for my book is is outsiders. But it's really interesting to see how people have reacted so far, and I'm looking forward to more engagements in future. And uh, what, what's the reception been like? Because uh, we, we love it. Yeah, it's it's been really fascinating to see. I mean, as I said, primarily the audience for me was, was outsiders. I'm obviously writing in English as a non-Indonesian, uh, really for people who might not know much about the country. But I've been really heartened by the response from Indonesia so far, where some people have managed to get their hands on copies of it. And a lot of people have told me it's really helped them kind of make sense of their own government, their own political situation, just because it's, it's useful to, to see how outsiders see you. Just like I always read for fun the New York Times stories about my country, the United Kingdom, and sometimes laugh at their kind of the ridiculous ways uh, they describe uh, my nation, but also learn a lot from the outsider's perspective. So I think it's it's been something similar and just always fascinated uh, by the innovative ways that Indonesians try and get hold of things. So my book is actually already circulating in hardback copy in Indonesia, but that is a pirated hardback. There is no official hardback, uh, but it's already on all the kind of e-commerce sites and bookshops. So people have moved really quickly to get their hands ah. on it. And it, <laughs> it just goes to show it's That's a lesson. Good. <laughs> if, yeah, if you want to fight piracy, you know, you've got to make sure your product is actually in the market, uh, because if it's not, someone else will find a way to put your product there in an unofficial format. What's the response been like from the palace? I haven't had any direct conversations, um, but I've obviously talked to quite a few people in different parts of the government. You know, I think... There was some nervousness, to be frank, initially, because some of the Indonesian media picked up on more critical parts of the book. And as journalists do, because I used to be one, simplified and exaggerated kind of the, the harshest criticisms of Jokowi. And I think that made a few people um, in the government a bit nervous, frankly. Um, but since then, um, you know, I think I've had private feedback from people saying, you know, they appreciate my efforts to try and explain things, to try and, um, you know, raise Indonesia's profile. You know, some people aren't happy with some of the more critical elements. And I think that's that's fine. Um, that's what a book should do. The other interesting thing is I've heard that maybe it's prompted people in the palace to try and get their own version of Jokowi's story out in English through their own kind of official biography. So that would be great too, if it stimulates their them to, to put their own version out, that's good. I wanted to promote more debate, more discussion about his leadership. So look forward to seeing if that uh, project eventuates. Yeah, well, the book is really useful, Ben. It really uh, plugs a hole that uh, has existed for the, for the general observer and for the, the broader international audience, the non-academic uh, field. Uh, because um, yeah, there's so much been unfolding over the past few years, and, and your book really uh, covers the waterfront and uh, is really comprehensive, uh, but yet readable and uh, succinct. So it's uh, it's a good achievement. Yeah, there's been a, a lot of uh, uh, you know lamenting that there aren't there isn't a there hasn't been a biography about uh, about an Indonesian pro- well. About, about Jokowi and maybe it's pretty light coverage out there, but someone's got to do it. So you're a pioneer. It's great. Yeah, I was just right place at the right time, I guess, having moved to Indonesia, you know, just when Jokowi was running for Jakarta governor. And the fact that Indonesia is so open and it allows you as a foreign journalist to get access to, to him and to, to people around him, that it was really the opportunities that Indonesia gave me that allowed me to do it. I think it'd be really hard to do the same kind of thing in many of the other countries I've, I've worked in. But Ben, I got a question for you, which is that uh, I think it strikes me that one of the supreme difficulties in the project that you took on is the topic itself, because uh, as the title says, Man of Contradictions, it's an enigma. And uh, yeah, it, it must have driven you crazy having to wrestle with uh, how Widodo is all over the map on so many uh, themes and policy areas. Uh, was that a problem? Yeah, it really was. So when I was starting out in my in my research, you know, I, you 
if you're writing a book, you really have to have a title that encapsulates the whole book. In this case, kind of encapsulates the man and his his leadership. And it was really tough because people have thrown all these different labels at Jokowi over the years. And I think many of them have an element of truth and an element of dissonance, and none of them quite gets there. So people have called him, you know, a reformer, a hero of, of democracy, a technocrat, um, someone who's led by you know, business. Uh, and most recently, people have said that he's becoming an, an authoritarian, he's a nationalist, he's a populist. And I think there's, there's a degree of, of reality in all those terms. None of them quite gets there. And actually, the, the contradictions idea came from one of his ministers when I was, I was discussing it with him. And I said, help me make sense of this guy. You, you've worked with him. You've known him for quite a long time. You know, how can I encapsulate what sort of leader or person Jokowi is? And he said, well, look, He's a bundle of contradictions, um, like all of us and like Indonesia. And I know some academics have said that that's a bit of a cop out saying I'm not willing to come up with an argument. But I think it reflects the fact that we are as humans much more contradictory than we like to admit. And a lot of political leaders are too. And there isn't any kind of simple way um, to describe him. And I think it reflects the fact that when Jokowi, for example, says, I want to attract foreign investment. And then the same day he says, we have to hate foreign products. Um, it's not, it's not just a flip-flop. It's not like I've changed my mind. I think he actually thinks both things at the same time. He thinks he can both get foreign investment and encourage Indonesians to hate foreign products at the, at the same moment. So I think there is a contradiction there, which I argue in the book kind of reflects these deeper contradictions in, in Indonesia's kind of formation as a state and the realities of the country today. So I think he's, he's very much reflective of that. We saw it, a bit of it in his predecessor, Susilo Bambang Yudhiyono, but I think it's much more apparent in, in Jokowi. He will do whatever it takes on the day to make a deal to move to to get a certain thing done, right? He seems to be a, a lot more goal task oriented, especially if it's infrastructure you can touch and drive on and ride a, put a train on. In a sense, but then here lies one of the other other contradictions, right, Jeff? That yes, that's true to an extent, but then he's so instinctive. So while he's sort of task oriented, he's not task oriented through data, through gaming out, you know, the what's the different outcomes with his advisors in a very kind of technical, practical sense. He really goes with his gut instinct. So he wants to get things done, um, but that's why I don't think you can call him a technocrat. So even there, it's quite hard to come to a firm conclusion um, about is he really that task oriented? You know, yes, when it comes to infrastructure if you look at the covid handling not very much how about how about this ben uh, one one observation i've had about him is the fact that uh, from what i can tell he never served in an organization until he became solo mayor in 2005 and even then arguably he wasn't in an organization he was on top of it and therefore maybe i think i suspect that's why he has been singularly unable to grapple with the problem of civil service reform or the bureaucracy what do you think about that I think that's, that's very true. I mean, we're all shaped by our experiences in life and people always hope that their political leaders will change. But why would they? Right? None of, how many of us really change once we're past the age of 18, 25, 30? So, of course, um, Jokowi, like everyone else, was shaped by his early experience, kind of grappling his own way in the world, um, studying forestry, setting up his own little business, using a few local connections, but not really formal organization. Yes, he had a small business. Yes, he did some exports, but he wasn't running a big business where he had to have management processes in place, et cetera. And he, he ran the business with family members helping once he'd, he'd moved to be mayor. So I think there's definitely something in that. And we see that in the way Jokowi governs through personalities, not processes. So he doesn't look to set up, you know, he doesn't have a kitchen cabinet like SBY of advisors who can get things done. He doesn't like SBY have these empowered offices who are meant to implement programs. He just looks to different people at different times. And what we find is maybe with the exception of Luhut, Panjaitan, but even in that case, these personalities come and go out of favor with, with Jokowi. So, you know, someone like Anis Baswedan, you know, for a while, he was very much there with Jokowi, you know, going all the way. They fell out. We saw it with Susi Pujastuti, uh, Ignatius Jonan before as energy minister and transportation minister. So even then, even with the personalities, there's this kind of rotating cast. It's not like he has these fixed people, uh, for the most part, who've come with him all the way. So it's really interesting. But I think it is a question of being led by 
by experience rather than kind of knowledge and reading and thinking about the world. Um, so he's very much an instinctive politician. That's his, his genius, I think. His instincts for retail politics are so good. But I think it's been hard to translate those instincts, as you said, Kevin, into effective reform of the civil service and the way more generally things are done in Indonesia. Did you see an, uh, that internet meme after the last uh, cabinet reshuffle? It was Luhu uh, Panjaitan's <laughs> picture for every cabinet post. <laughs> it was one doing arounds. <laughs> well, although, you know, the thing about the cabinet, though, is that uh, you, you were saying how uh, Widodo has contradictions and these are reflected in Indonesia's own contradictions. Uh, but there's a, there's a tertiary layer as well in the middle, which is the cabinet is full of contradictions. So Louis Panjaitan gets a lot of attention, but uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Pratikno, the state secretary. Is that somebody that you uh, came across much? Because he keeps a very low profile, but when he does say something, I've found that it's worth listening to. And I, I seem to see him being behind most of the positive and constructive reforms in, in the institutional area anyway. Um, did, did you come across him much in all your interviews, uh, Ben? Oh, I'm not. I, I met him once or twice and have observed him. He's not someone I'm, I'm particularly close to, to be frank. But I think I think you're right, Kevin. You're on something there that um, so many officials in Jokowi's government and including the president himself, um, you know, they'll say one thing one minute, say the next thing later that day or, or the next day. But but he really is one of those people who tends to speak with a bit more caution, a bit more authority, um, which is which is really interesting. So he's definitely one of the, the doers. I also think Mahfoud MD as well, who we have to remember was initially meant to be uh, Jokowi's preferred choice for vice president. And while he's much quieter than, than Panjaitan, he attracts a lot less noise. He's actually been across a lot of the most difficult decisions that Jokowi has taken for better and for worse. So I think he's another interesting figure who plays quite an important role attracting a lot less sort of media coverage, as it were, but perhaps you know quite just as if not more influential. But I think the problem is that, that there's always so much shifting. So in the first term, my sense was really that it was the office of Yusuf Kala, uh, the vice president, the first vice president, that was really playing the most um, important role in terms of coordination of policy, particularly when it came to bureaucratic reforms, to reforms that would help foreign investors to set up business, to get visas, etc. But that's shifted totally now that you have a, a effectively redundant uh, vice president with uh, Maruf Amin, the senior veteran, former cleric there. So I think there's been shifting sands over time, but I think you're certainly right to point out uh, the role of his role right now. But I think the, these things are liable to change. And even Luhut himself, we have to remember, he's kind of come and gone in, in Jacoby's favor um, at, at different times. So, so it's really fascinating to see this kind of constantly moving scene. It's like more like a court, I argue, in the book uh, than a traditional cabinet setting with people seeking Jacoby's ear, getting it for a while, then falling out of favor, someone else sort of coming up, sidling up to Jokowi. And Jokowi, I think, keeping a deliberate distance so that when things go well, he's able to kind of lean into the minister and take credit. When things go badly, he sort of distances himself from them and then says, oh, someone else has to come in and clean this mess up now because such and such a person hasn't done what was expected of them. So what are, you, what are your thoughts about uh, the, the, I know we're still a couple years out, but uh, any rising stars on making their way to 2024 you're keeping your eye on? I mean, there's, there's so many names, and I think we have to be somewhat humble here. Uh, we are at least three years out from the next election. And remember, Jokowi only emerged, uh, what, less than two years or, or, or perhaps two years out from, from his first presidential election victory in 2014. So Indonesian politics is really unpredictable. There's been a lot of talk about the decline of, of democracy and democratic stagnation. That obviously speaks, I think, to democratic practices and rights. But I still think the elections are really pretty competitive. So there's so many names in, in the frame. We see governors like Anis Paswedan in Jakarta, Ridwan Kamil in, in West Java, Ganja Pranowo in Central Java, and then cabinet members, of course, like Prabowo, uh, multiple failed presidential candidate, what is it, four or five times, you might say he's tried for the presidency now. He's finally got a job in government, which is which is good, good for him. Um, and even Eric Thohir, who is one of the closest ministers to Jokowi now. I mean, he helped to to run the campaign at the last election. Um, interestingly, going into business most recently with uh, Jokowi's uh, second son in 
football in uh, in Solo, where now the oldest son is mayor. So so very interesting seeing those kind of deepening of the business political connections uh, between Eric Thor here and, and, and Jacoby's family. And that potentially uh, could, could lay the ground for, for more political opportunities for him in future. He's obviously uh, quite a smart guy with quite interesting experience. And the other thing is, I think, just lastly, I think we've seen, obviously, we've only had two directly elected presidents in Indonesia, but we've had seven in total. And um, interesting to see very different characters each time. Not everyone has emerged from, from democracy, let alone direct democracy. But, uh, you know, Indonesian people tend to shift the kind of preferences based on who they had last in, in the job. And I think that's a natural process in any country. So, Obviously, the obvious thing would be, oh, we'll, need, we'll have another local leader who gets things done on the ground and talks simply like Jokowi. But maybe the voters will fancy someone different. And in the end, of course, there's also a lot of power to the political parties to form coalitions uh, to try and block certain people um, so that they'll have a big role to play in, in how this thing shakes out in the next couple of years as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit apprehensive of myself. I think of uh, one of Widodo's greatest attributes is the fact that he is not Prabowo. And uh, you know, things are uh, always comparative. And um, yeah, there's... Uh, you think that's how he, he won it last time? <laughs> was that he wasn't Prabowo? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, you know, Widodo does have some, uh, some humility and um, integrity. And uh, meanwhile, there's a lot of politicians who are uh, far worse in, in those areas. So uh, there's a lot of inherent risk in the... Um, 2024 process, which you know, the, the parties will be deciding on the candidates in probably um, mid 2023. And um, that's uh, just a little over two years away. So, yeah, we're about a year away from, from politics really being intense. Um, and, yeah, with all those dynamics of opinion polls and regional heads and parties and so on. But anyway, Ben, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, the current affairs and uh, current events which are unfolding because. A lot of the themes that you uh, laid forth in your book are, are still unfolding in, in real time, uh, very, uh, very you know, uh, vividly. Um, I guess yeah, on economic. Uh, let's start with economics. Um, I guess you've been following the economic reforms that have been uh, coming forth following the omnibus law. What do you think about that whole process? And what does it tell you about Widodo's second term so far? I think. It the second time has been difficult because of, of COVID-19, just like it's been pretty difficult for, for the whole world. But obviously, for a large developing country like Indonesia, it presents particular challenges. So I think that's, that's the difficulty. Obviously, he wanted his second term to be all about economic reform, uh, moving from this shift from this focus on hard infrastructure on bridges and roads and airports to soft infrastructure to education and skills and, and healthcare, while also pushing ahead with a few key uh, hard infrastructure projects like his plan for a new capital city in Kalimantan. Um, but I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic has obviously dealt that a big blow. It's pushed Indonesia into its first recession since the Asian financial crisis. Um, it's forced uh, quite a few people out of jobs, but also, more importantly, for most of the Indonesian workforce in the informal sector, it's really hit their, their incomes, challenged their ability to, to put food on the tables for their family, as well as being a big healthcare challenge for an overstretched system. So I think that that's made it difficult. I mean, given all that, it's quite remarkable in the sense that Jokowi did push this omnibus uh, job creation bill through very, very quickly. Um, and I know it's got quite a lot of foreign investors pretty excited. There's been a lot of um, highfalutin rhetoric about um, this being a big bang reform to open up all parts of the Indonesian economy to foreign investors to make it easier to hire and fire workers, etc. But the, the challenge, I think, is we haven't seen a shift in mentality in terms of how Jokowi and his government more generally approaches foreign investment. So there's still this kind of deep-seated nativist or economic nationalist instinct in Indonesia, which the president himself embodies. And unfortunately, kind of rent-seeking conglomerates and uh, corrupt officials in various different ministries are able to exploit those sentiments to profit at the cost of foreign investors. So, so I think the urgency of these reforms speaks to me more about the, the dire um, outlook for the economy and the need for foreign investment than it does for kind of the understanding of a need for root and branch reform of the economic system. And I think we see that in Jokowi making comments, like, like I mentioned earlier, about you know, loving Indonesian products and hating foreign products, while at the same time promoting foreign investment, because 
that's effectively a signal to to bureaucrats in the trade ministry, the ind industry ministry, the uh, manpower ministry to make life tough for foreign investors. It simply is. And, and he obviously instinctively understands that. So I think effectively what you see with the omnibus law and with the revisions to the, the so-called negative investment list to in theory, open up a lot more sectors to foreign investment is you're expanding the pie in some sense, but it's not getting any easier to eat that pie. It's still going to be pretty hard to set up your business in Indonesia, to get all your permits, to keep your permits, to get visas for your foreign workers. So net net, you know, things will get a bit better, I think, uh, but it's not going to be the sort of transformation, I think, that Indonesia needs to meet Jokowi's ambitious goals uh, for economic growth, uh, for building a more just society in Indonesia, or even for Indonesia to keep up with the need to employ you know, the two to three million young people entering the workforce each year. But just setting up this podcast company, <laughs> if uh, with my name, uh, we're, we're, we're registering it, if my name's on it, it's a it's, it's a six month uh, uh, process with, uh, with with several weeks even before that, just to determine whether or not I should be even and um, in, in whether the the business with me on it should be in the field at all. So I I, I say well I, I thought there was a one stop shop. Mm, well, yeah, kind of, but there's some fine print. So. Yeah, I think it comes back, that comes back to the mentality in this question of Indonesia itself, which I think a lot of foreign investors just don't understand that Indonesia's foundation, its constitution is economic nationalist. It's almost proto or quasi socialist, which is ironic given that communism is, is illegal in Indonesia. But, you know, the constitution puts, sets out this vision for a kind of family oriented economy with, um, you know, the state taking key control of natural resources. And that speaks to you know, Indonesia's history of exploitation at the hands of, of Western colonialist liberalis, liberals um, in economic terms. I think that's really deep seated. You can't wish that away. And the problem with Jokowi's kind of contradictory appro approach is that he hasn't laid out a compromise solution where such and such sectors are, are protected and we'll have an industrial policy here and these sectors are fully open. Um, his language is so deeply contradictory that, as I say, empowers civil servants and others to make life difficult for foreign investors, thereby undoing the promise of, of opening up various sectors and simplifying different processes. The other uh, challenge, just finally, is, as we were alluding to earlier, that Jokowi is not very good at implementation. He's not empowering key people or institutions to transform the way business is done. He's just trusting different fixes at different times to push certain parts, certain legislation or solve certain problems. Uh, but I think Again, that's not enough to transform the, the business environment. So while um, Jokowi's um, administration has been very good at gaming this kind of quite closely watched World Bank ease of doing business ranking, I don't speak to many foreign investors who think it's actually in any sense easier now to do things than it was five, six years ago. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic, really, just because these changes to the labor law are something that was uh, so... Uh, problematic for so many investors for uh, nearly two decades and, and they, they finally do exist now. They're real changes and uh, you know, it's, uh, it is going to be significantly easier for investors, especially in the manufacturing sector, to hire and fire workers, uh, especially because the costs of dismissing or carrying out layoffs is going to be um, half of what it was or, or even less. Uh, and then there's the the foreign ownership list. Uh, the ceilings are um, uh, almost entirely removed, and, and that's something that uh, I've been looking to have happen for 15 years now. It's amazing that it actually finally happened. Uh, you quoted uh, the 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 Sadley's law in your uh, book about uh, how bad times uh, make good policy, and uh, good times make bad policy. And this uh, the the spate of reforms that have come out just in the past few months. Um, really uh, are, are remarkable, I think, especially given how we don't know was very much more towards economic nationalism um, in this uh, first few years in office. Um, but uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the mentality is still uh, yet to change. So yeah, I think there's some changes around the edges and maybe there's some critical mass that'll finally happen, at least in a few sectors that'll help spur a little bit of growth, hopefully. Yeah, and privatization of state-owned state -owned enterprises, yeah? <laughs> or maybe a little bit. They're, yeah, they're using the word, at least. <laughs>
But I think it's it's all about the base you're coming from, right? So the Indonesia overall, if you if you look at the barriers to trade and investment for foreign investors, they're pretty high. So coming from there, any reforms are obviously good. And you you can improve things marginally, and that's obviously positive. But I think it's just important to to understand that that the reason why it's so difficult, it's not just because Indonesian officials are stupid and they can't read a World Bank report and learn how to do things properly, or they can't look at what you know Thailand or Vietnam did with export processing zones. It's because Indonesia doesn't want to do those things for political reasons and partly because of the structure of the political economy where we have these, these big conglomerates and state and enterprises who you know, maybe they truly believe in economic nationalism, but they obviously have a vested interest too in blocking foreign investors uh, from coming in unless it's purely on their terms. So I think it's important to understand those kind of institutional and historical blockages and not just to see it as a technocratic problem, because I don't think that's where most of the, the issue is. In terms of the, the blockages and breakthroughs, we saw real breakthrough in the um, sort of the, the, the culture wars the banning of uh, a mandatory religious card in schools that that was and and uh, the watering down of the ITE that's uh, a, a real shocking move. What do you make of those, Ben? I think it's too early to make any judgment given sort of Jacoby's track record um, on the you know the the IT and communications and transactions law. Obviously, it's become a bit of a symbol of the pressure on democratic practice and, and rights in Indonesia because it's been used more and more systematically under uh, the Jokowi administration. It started under SBY, but it's been used more and more systematically to target various critics of, of the government. And you can see in the data that people sort of saying um, things that are you know would be deemed potentially in breach of the law, but against opponents of the government are much more rarely targeted. And Jokowi's indicated that there might be some changes there, but we haven't, haven't seen the substance yet of those changes or if there is a shift by the police in how they how they use this this law so i think it's it's too early to say but it but it's clear that Jacoby is in some sense responsive to criticism. I mean, I think this, the fact that he said something reflected uh, a certain unease with the way he was being presented and criticized for being too tough on criticism. So he's not a completely rigid leader, but I think it's too early to say if there's actually been a shift um, in, in how he sees you know, himself engaging with, with civil society, with, with the media, etc. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree that it's going to take some time to unfold uh, to, to make sure that the actions match up with uh, the rhetoric that we've seen thus far. But the uh, the appointment of Listio Prabowo as police chief is uh, distinctly promising, I think, uh, especially, again, in, on a comparative basis relative to the police chiefs that preceded him. Then the other thing is just that it's uh, I, th I think that uh, if we look at the step back a bit and look at the big picture contrast the situation now in 2021 versus how it was in, for example, mid-2018, when Widodo had uh, picked uh, uh, yeah, Amin as his vice president. And um, yeah, things looked pretty dire with regards to uh, sectarianism and, and upholding pluralism in Indonesia. Uh, there's really been uh, quite, a, quite a big shift uh, since that time for whatever reason. I, I suspect it's I, I tend to wonder whether Widodo is simply growing more confident uh, finally now as a president in his second term, not having to face re-election with some experience under his belt and having given away so many cabinet seats to so many parties that there is basically no political opposition. Um, and, and therefore, he's uh, able now to be more assertive on things such as uh, sectarian threats to pluralism. It's it's really interesting to see the shift, Kevin, that you mentioned, because it was just a few years ago, obviously, that uh, Jokowi went out of the palace to pray with um, the leader of uh, FPE, um, Habib Rizik Shihab, uh, to try and sort of calm down his hundreds of thousands of followers. Um, so he, he went out there and sort of showed his respect to them. And a few years later, obviously, recently, um, he bans his organization. And, and now the kind of FPI, former FPI leader is obviously facing various criminal charges. So yeah, it does seem to suggest a kind of growing confidence and obviously being reelected and time limited, I think, helps there. I mean, I think the other the other problem here, if whether it's talking about you know religious issues or, or the economy or or politics, is and this is really what I was trying to get at in my book, is that with Indonesia we always allow our hopes to run way ahead of reality, and then when you're mugged by reality, people are always really disappointed and go too far the other way. 
Um, and the reality is it's just, but, you know, this is a big country. It's, you know, only been a democracy for less than 25 years in its, its second incarnation with, you know, some form of democratic elections. It's very diverse. Uh, it's spread out geographically. It's, it's a very difficult place to govern, of course, like any other huge developing country. So these, it takes time to change mentalities. It takes time um, to reform things. As I say that there, there tends to be an over-exaggeration or too much fear of, of of Indonesia falling apart that then quickly changes to Indonesia, you know, being the next Asian tiger, being the solution to the South China Sea problem or, or Myanmar or whatever it is. And that's also completely unrealistic. So when you, my attempts with the book is to really to ground people in reality to understand why things are the way they are and not, not to expect too much, um, but to understand that there is also room for progress and we don't have to despair every time and you know, things don't go exactly as, as we hope. I heard you mention Myanmar, so uh, I got to ask you about that. And um, in the book, you mentioned that Indonesia's foreign policy is really, to a great extent, driven by domestic political perceptions. So, therefore, um, I'm worried about your answer to this question, which is, will Indonesia care about Myanmar? <laughs> uh, and I will mention that uh, just there's uh, some very recent developments. Uh, Widodo, I think quite surprisingly, actually called for a uh, ASEAN summit of some sort on Myanmar. And that, that call just came forth on uh, 19 March. And then also the uh, military chief spoke with the uh, uh, a Myanmar military figure uh, in an ASEAN forum as well. So on the one hand, it looks as if maybe there's some progress finally emanating from ASEAN's largest country towards uh, applying some pressure on, on the Myanmar junta. Uh, but I suspect that, what do you think, Ben? Is it probably going to fizzle? Look, I think the Myanmar issue is, is so difficult for any outsider to to get involved in. In the end, it's almost certainly going to be what happens will be determined by what players on the ground do. And, and one of the reasons, of course, that, that Australia, the US, even China keep saying ASEAN should be front and center in, in resolving Myanmar is because they don't have a bloody clue what to do either. And so they're effectively passing the buck on to ASEAN while also, of course, paying homage to ASEAN centrality and unity and all the, the good sort of motherhood uh, statements that, that we love about, about the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. But I think when it comes to Indonesia's role, I think there's two important elements to understand right now. One is just the history of Indonesia's independent and active foreign policy, which is really grounded in non-alignment in the protection of Indonesia's sovereignty and territorial integrity above all else, which means limiting Indonesia's desire to meddle. And, and the historical experience has always been that under Sukarno and then to a lesser extent under Suharto, the more Indonesia got entangled in the affairs of the region and great powers, the more domestic chaos it caused. So I think that sort of grounded um, the, the foreign ministry and other political leaders in the sense of just try to do as little as you can to protect Indonesia, which I think is really understandable. It means that often this independent and active uh, looks more like constrained and passive in reality, which makes it hard um, to, to be creative. The other element here is Jokowi's own particular approach to foreign policy, where he sees it ultimately um, as a tool to promote trade and investment, whereas SB SBY obviously wanted Indonesia to be seen as this beacon of democracy. He wanted to be seen as a substantial international figure in his own right. Um, Jokowi tends to say to his advisors, you know, why should I go to the UN? Uh, why should I go to ASEAN? There's no money there. I'm happy to go to a G20 or an APEC or World Economic Forum to get investment, but he's not interested in kind of formulaic foreign policy statements. Um, so I think it has been surprising, and he is a, a leader who will always surprise us, and I want to make that clear, that he, he has stepped up a bit on the Myanmar question. I think it's also to do with his growing trust and, co and comfortableness of his relationship with his foreign minister, Ibu uh, Retno Masudi. I think Jokowi doesn't like to be upstaged by his ministers. He doesn't like them to cause trouble, but he's trusted her over the last few years more and more, so he's given her a bit more room to step up a bit on the Myanmar question. I think she obviously sees uh, um, potential and a need to try and stamp her kind of authority on the foreign policy world of Southeast Asia, you know, much like her predecessors, uh, Martin Natalagawa and Hassan Warayuda did in, in the past. So I think she's probably driving this and she's obviously used her political capital with him um, to get him to come out and push for this this summit. We'll have to see what happens. I think it's, it's good to see Indonesia raising a bit of pressure. And I say, while we can talk about 
democratic backsliding. I think Indonesia, you know, understandably still sees itself as a democratic transitional success story, one of the very few in our region and in our, in our world. And it wants to keep its, its position there. So I think it's good. And we've seen countries, neighbors like Singapore, uh, Malaysia, are actually falling in behind Indonesia, willing Indone- allowing Indonesia to take the brunt of the criticism from all sides for stepping up and trying to mediate. So I think that's been really positive to see and does reflect a bit of a kind of um, step away from really the passivity on foreign policy of the f- of the first term, but I think there's limits in the end to what Indonesia kind of can um, do and what it will be willing to do o- on this question. Unfortunately, uh, but mostly that reflects kind of the, the realities of the situation in Myanmar and just the the, the realities of how ASEAN as an organisation is run. Right. Yeah, it comes down to leverage, and uh, no one really has a whole lot of leverage over Myanmar because. Yeah, Myanmar is just not very well integrated. Um, there's China, of course, and Thailand, but uh, I don't know about ASEAN overall and uh, a lot of the you know, states in uh, Europe and uh, yeah, the U.S. lack leverage. Um, then, of course, there's Japan, but they, they, Japan doesn't tend to use much leverage, I don't think. So, um, yeah. And we know that when when the UN special envoy for Myanmar spoke to the the number two in the Myanmar military after the coup and said, if you carry on down this path, you're going to end up isolated. They just said, that's fine. We've been there before. We know we know how to survive with our backs to the wall. And I think sadly, sadly, it's true. I mean, I think one one interesting thing for me about Indonesia and its potential is, you know, I, I think in this sort of situation, you could actually do with some sort of informal envoy rather than working through the formal structures of ASEAN, which are so, so limited. And there, a suggestion from the Jakarta Post was that SBY should get involved as a former general um, who transitioned to become a democratic leader. And I think there is something about having a, a former military man going to talk to, to generals the way their, their deportment is, the way they act, can maybe make some, some progress. But then the tragedy, of course, is because of the domestic political scene at the moment in Indonesia with probably relations between SBY and his family and Jokowi at an all-time low, that's obviously completely off the cards. But that would have been an interesting situation, potentially, if SBY were to have gone in a personal capacity, not even as a formal envoy. But obviously, that would require the backing of the government. But yeah, that's off the cards, I, I think. And that is fantastic. I'm going to sign sign us off here. The book is Man of Contradictions, Joko Widodo, and the Struggle to Remake Indonesia. The author is Ben Bland of the Lowy Institute. The book will be coming to a fine bookstore near you in Southeast Asia. When when does that happen? When does Penguin uh, make the shift? So the books have already been printed and they're in the warehouse and they're now sort of slowly making their way around the region through this kind of COVID adult logistics system. Um, So hopefully uh, not not for too long, but it's also available on all kind of good online platforms as well. But it's nice to support your local bookshop, which we've been doing, doing it pretty tough in the last year for obvious reasons. Ben, fantastic to have you along. Thanks both. Great to talk. Bye. And that's the program. Thanks to Ben Bland of the Lowy Institute. Our producer and editor is Stephen Handoko. Music by Blue Dot Sessions. For a free trial of Kevin O'Rourke's Reformasi Weekly Newsletter, check out his website at reformasi.info. You can reach us at Instagram at onthelevel underscore media. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe and rate us. It helps. This podcast is a production of On The Level Media. I'm Jeff Hutton. Bye for now.